So next up, um, we are having another keynote, and we, go, we want to welcome Jack O'Horan. He is the CEO and co-founder of Scale Labs, a company responsible for the Scale Network, a blockchain scalability platform that enables developers to build and deploy Ethereum applications quickly and cost-effectively. With over 20 years of experience in the price software and blockchain, Jack has founded multiple successful startups, including Instant Align and Actana. He has also held senior roles at Google, Google, Good Technology, later acquired by Motorola. Please welcome Jack Horan. Hello, how's everyone doing? All right, awesome. Hey, there has been some phenomenal content here. Uh, it's been amazing. Um, so to kick this off, I've got a question. Who here has used a Web3 application today? Okay, yeah, that's, that's good. That's, uh, what about in the last month? And exchanges don't count. Okay, okay, we've got more people. So part of my message is, is that that's going to change dramatically in two ways. One, the amount of hands will go up dramatically. Two, I think a lot of people are going to start using Web3 applications and hopefully not even know they're using Web3 applications, okay? Like, we, we've got to get there. Um, so, so I'm going to be talking about that today. All right, so uh, I'm the co-founder of the Scale Network. Scale is a decentralized blockchain network that's designed for Ethereum scalability. It's kind of like layer two plus. It's a, a, a purpose-built model for creating a user-centric uh, application environment, which, I'll, which it's not a talk about scale today, but that's what I've been focused on. Started this in early 2018. I've been in Silicon Valley since 2005 doing tech startups. And, um, and when I learned about these core principles of blockchain, I was you know, completely uh, pulled down this path, okay? And, and so when I was starting my, my you know, next company on my, in my career in 2017, it was just a no-brainer to do something within the Ethereum ecosystem. So, but I have to say, I've seen what I would say is slow and steady growth um, and I worked in mobile also in 2005, and let me tell you, the app environment mobile was slow and steady, but then out of nowhere, it just skyrocketed, right? And who here used a mobile application in, let's say, 2005? Does anyone remember? Like, it was like 2G networks and uh, devices weren't very powerful, and then all of a sudden the iPhone hit, and there's millions of people simultaneously playing games with each other that we kind of... It was unimaginable a few years before. I think we're in one of those moments, and I'm going to be talking about that today. All right. Um, well, why aren't there already a billion users using Web3? Well, three core reasons. UX, UX, and UX, okay? User experience. We're lacking user experience. Um, well, why, why is this the case? Why, why do we have this challenge? Well, the reality is it's a real challenge. It's not easy because security and user experience are diametrically opposed. These things pull at each other. Um, let's take an example um, of, of anyone remember like this Bitcoin narrative in 2012 and 13 and 14 where people were literally keeping their private keys written on paper in safes, right? In multiple safes in different places. Well, that's pretty secure, even though I wouldn't do that. I don't think it's that secure, but that's on the far end of the security realm. And it's the furthest end from usability. Let's say you wanted to use that Bitcoin in an application. Well, you'd be impossible. It's written on, the access is written on paper. Um, and obviously within the Ethereum ecosystem, there's varying levels of custody. But I'm gonna get into that a little bit today because these things, um, it's hard to be both secure and have a good user experience. But we're, we're there, and we're not there because of one item. We're there because of a lot of things coming together in layers, okay? Um, I like to think of, you know, you think about the growth of blockchain. I, I wrote about this recently, about this, you know, blockchain hierarchy of needs. Who's familiar with the Maslow hierarchy of needs? Okay, most people, right? It's, you know, you don't really care about your, your higher order uh, desires, and if you don't have food, <laughs> shelter, safety, right? But once you have these things, you eventually start caring about other things, and eventually you can be self-actualized and really propel yourself. Well, I think blockchain has gone on a very similar path. We couldn't worry about UX if the assets weren't secure. We couldn't worry about decentralization if we didn't have good... Uh, Good security, okay? And decentralization and security and performance 
have long been thought of not as a stacking element like we're seeing here, but as <coughs> different points on a triangle. And who's heard of the trilemma? Um, so the trilemma is something that I think is soon to be history because of different trade-offs and culmination of different types of products, okay? But our goal is not just to be secure, not just to be decentralized, not just to have great performance, but to ultimately be accessible to hundreds of millions or billions of users. One interesting thing to note with societal acceptance is if you look at the media right now and you read news, the majority, I, a huge percentage of stories we're reading are about government compliance, about securities regulation. And that's because the topic has changed from which protocol is the fastest to are we ready to create a framework within governments because this thing is real, okay? So the, the conversation's changing and so are the challenges. So societal acceptance includes not just, you know, are people ready to use Web3 applications, but are governments ready to create frameworks that make businesses and decentralized uh, entities able to operate? And so the conversation's changing and I noticed today in the talks, accessibility is also a new trend, right? Every single topic today, every single conversation, there is a component around usability, accessibility. And that's because we've solved these other pieces, okay? All right, well, let's talk a little bit about how we make Web3 more accessible. I know there's a lot of builders here. Um, this is, I have the, one of, I'd say the best parts of my job is I talk to people every day who are building across the entire stack. I get this amazing vantage point to talk to people um, on the very surface level all the way to deep ecosystem products. And it's unbelievable what's coming together. So my feeling about accessibility is there's three pillars, all right? Uh, and accessibility to how we access billions of users. One is authentication and, and identity. Second is wallets, custody, and ramps, which is essentially, um, well, the first piece is like, who are you? The second piece is, um, where do I hold the assets? Who holds them? <laughs> and how do I get money in traditional fiat in and out of Web3 ecosystems? The last piece is protocol level improvements, okay? Um, so authentication and identity. We're finally at this era where people can go and actually use traditional auth methods to have an identity within a Web3 application. So. Um, there's a cool game called Delph's Table. It's a mini game and, you know, I think only a couple thousand people play it, but it's a really cool example where you can go there, log in with Gmail, log in with Facebook, it'll create a MetaMask wallet for you, and it has a full decentralized backup system for account recovery, which I'll talk about later. It's a good example, but there's a lot of these examples out there. Um, and your identity in the past was just your 0x address, all right? It was just your Ethereum address. But identity in every other system is usually on an account basis or an individual basis, right? And that's why we had uh, uh, Gary at Salesforce talking about things they're building to help businesses manage people. But businesses also want to think about you as a person, you as an email, you as an identity, not just 0x address. And so these different authentication methods enable that, all right? Um, now going a little further there, uh, you, uh, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. Uh, I think it's a best practice that if you are going to leverage um, traditional auth methods and let people connect their wallets or let, enable them to create a wallet, you should also let people who want to have a, a crypto identity utilize that. Maybe they, and you, you should let them uh, use MetaMask and Ledger just as, you know, uh, obviously within the, the framework of your compliance strategy. But if you don't cater to crypto native users, you're going to lose you know, the network effects of, of, of speaking to that audience. You want people, if you're launching applications, who use Web3 applications to use it, not just the masses. So I think having flexibility and catering to different types of users is also a best practice. Um, okay, account recovery. So talking about this really quickly, let's say I use MetaMask and I, I can't get in, I lost my password. Well, I can plug in these 12 words or 24 words and I can get my, my, my account back. But what if I lose them? <laughs> and I'm, me, I'm, you know, kind of been doing blockchain for a really long time, so I've got some systems. But what about a normal user? They're not going to be able to get access to all of their NFTs and their history and their accounts. So you need recovery methods. And the cool thing is there's both centralized and decentralized recovery methods. 
And there's a whole topic around account, account abstraction, as well as using different multi-sig strategies and social recovery strategies to help users in both a decentralized or centralized manner. So the thing is, the brain power wasn't working on these problems before. The brain power was just working at the base level of the stack of these uh, blockchain hierarchy of needs. Okay, let's talk a little bit about wallets, custody, and RAM. So easy to use custodial wallets are a requirement for mass adoption. I'm just gonna say it. It's not a popular opinion amongst the super crypto native crowd and you know, like deep core principle people, but you need it. You're not gonna be able to cater to normal users without it. But again, it's great to have optionality um, around this. Now, there's a lot of advances happening with custodial wallets where you can just use an application and log in and then you don't even know the wallet's there. The wallet's doing the work for you. There's a lot of great companies building for that. Okay, um, boy, this is kind of interesting. Thanks for like looking at me and I've got the slides going over there, so. <laughs> All right, um, let's talk about uh, uh, ramps. So ramps are, here's the old workflow. I, you know, t go, to, go to Coinbase, I wanna use an application, so I go connect my bank account to Coinbase, send some money there, wait two days. Then I get, turn that money into Ethereum. And then I take that and I send it to a wallet and I hope it shows up. And then I have this other wallet and I think, okay, I'm a first time user, now I'm gonna try to use the application. And it's four days later. What do you think the user drop off is? <laughs> It's really poor, so we need to have ramps. We also need ramps not just into layer one environments, but layer two scaling environments. So that's something we deal with a lot at scale is helping our users and the users of the applications that build on scale get money from a credit card or a bank account directly into a decentralized application to purchase an NFT, to you know, do whatever they need to do within these uh, different dApps. Um, one thing I wanna call out is, is omnibus storage models. An omnibus storage model is a storage model where there's one wallet and uh, NFTs for that application are minted and they're just stored in that one, that one wallet. And then a web two application runs and users feel like they're using a web three application, but they're not really. And that's actually a good step one of many steps. If you just want to get up and running, it's okay. It's not you know, a cardinal sin to use an omnibus storage model, but I don't think it really speaks to the core principles and the powers of Web3. All the reasons why we like blockchain, all the things we talk about, don't really come to life if you're just minting NFTs, storing them somewhere, and then just kind of running a Web2 app, okay? Um, uh, so, but, so I would just warn people, if you have that strategy, be looking to move forward or you'll be leapfrogged by the people that learn about how to leverage decentralization and, uh, you know, and, um, and have good user experience. That's what we're going for. All right, uh, last piece here of these pillars is protocol level improvement. So one, gas fees, okay? Gas fees are an in, on a per user, per transaction basis, are an absolute impediment to any real growth, okay? If you, we learned this in web two. In web two, you wanna remove friction. You realize, let's get people to use things, use things. If they have to pay each time they do something, you disincentivize users to do things. They say, well, <laughs> how can I do less of this or do more in each try? And you actually cut down your usability. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of great things happening on the gas fee side. One with relayers. Um, also there are chains like Scale, for example, that have uh, a different unit economic model where uh, chains are paid for and transaction fees are paid for in a different model um, by applications on behalf of users. And there's even a different model down to the consensus level, so the unit economics work and the security. But to me, it's absolutely critical. There's been about 70 million on-chain transactions on scale um, in the last six months because of this. Um, it's a, it unlocks a lot of use cases. The other thing I wanna say is capacity-constrained blockchains at some point need to either raise costs or decrease performance, okay? And so monolithic layer one chains have a finite supply. And so if there's more demand than there is supply, then the prices go up. That's why gas fees are high in Ethereum. But Ethereum also has huge value um, and you know, can function and operate well because of scalability around it um, through integrated scalability. Uh, the last piece would be shared security, uh, pooled security chains, app chains, 
are a hot topic right now. You're going to hear a lot about it. This is what scale is. Scale has many, many chains. There's already 18 chains. There could be 1,800 or 18,000. But this is a hot model because you can have one validator set securing a network and many, many individualized chains that don't share, don't share performance, but they share security. It's a different, it's, and that's why, you know, one reason why we're starting to beat the trilemma because of all of these different models that have different trade-offs, but at the end of the day, they all come together to improve security, performance, and decentralization. Okay, um, two more thoughts and I'm, I'm done here today uh, is, and I'm gonna end on a, good, on a positive note, is we're actually here. I'm seeing amazing things every day um, and an amazing quantity of, of projects. I mean, just one example for us, our like uh, qualified partner component of our, I don't know if you'd call it a pipeline because it's a decentralized project, but applications are starting to build on scale. You know, used, used to be around, I think, 20 to 30 a month, and it's 5x that now. So the, the industry is growing. I think we're growing, but it's a reflection on the amount of people building in the space because the time is now. You can build highly scalable applications that have good UX finally because of all these different pieces coming together. One of the challenges as a builder is to figure out what is the right recipe for you? Who's your audience? What do they care about in terms of usability, decentralization, performance, security? All right. Um, uh, I think we're close, and I think people say, well, hey, when's blockchain going to be hot again? Well, I don't think it ever was not hot if you're building and you're in the utility. If you're looking at the markets, then clearly there's some significant waves. But the next wave of growth, in my opinion, is going to come through actual progress and traction because of usability, because of accessibility. And I think we're really close. Um, I felt like I couldn't give a talk today without ta saying one thing about AI. I worked in AI for almost a decade um, before I got into blockchain in 2018. Um, I just want to say, I get asked this a lot, so I just wanted to really quickly say, I think there's going to be three key phases. Um, one, I think the amount of applications built this year will be 10x of the prior year in Web3 because of efficiencies to build. Um, a lot of, and, and good, smart projects are integrating these efficiencies into their documentation and their tooling. Piece two, we're going to start seeing applications have connected components to generative AI. And applica de decentralized applications will have even more functionality. But the AI is not going to be decentralized. I think a lot of people like to talk about point three, where we have these decentralized models of fairness and community ownership over the data and the learning of the model. That's, that's a long ways out. Um, it'll be cool when it happens, but these first two pieces, I think we're going to start feeling those, that impact very soon. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day.